It's a blessing to be here with you today, and uh, you know, uh, Reagan, I thought about what you were saying and how all the music today is tied to what our lesson's about, and the thought of just standing around the throne of God. Can you imagine that? The standing around the throne of God to sing God's praises. It doesn't get better than that. So I want us to read today here uh, from our lesson it's going to come from the book of Luke, the fourth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 16, uh, and I'm probably going to warn the people on the sound booth, it might get a little bit louder, so they might have to turn me down a little bit. Uh, and it came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and he went into the synagogue, as was the custom on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And there was given him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and he opened the book and he found a place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and the recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty all who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and all the eyes of the synagogue were upon him. Please hear these words. In verse 21, he said, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, when you look at that passage of scripture, it's really fascinating. But what I want to do is I want to break it down for you. In Jewish literature, there's a, a thing called a chiastic Structure. Now, all of you that are in Grace University or been through Grace University, you know what I'm talking about. But you break it down, and this literary style will help you get to where you need to be. Now, that sounds like a big word, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this easy for everybody. If you drive through, and I guess we got McDonald's right here, if you drive through at McDonald's and you ordered a Big Mac, you're going to have a bun on top, and a bun on the bottom, right? You're going to have whatever it is, lettuce or whatever it is, cheese, whatever you want to put on it. You're going to have those kind of right underneath the bun. And then right in the middle is the beef. Now, if somebody ordered a cheeseburger and they ended up with a chicken in the middle. Then we would say they got the wrong order, right? So in order for you to get the right order, when you read your scripture, you can use this same technique that was used in Bible times. So this chiastic structure, and I'm going to ask them to pull that up on this time, and we'll take a look at that. Yep, it's going to be, there we go, all right. Now I want you to notice, I color-coded this for you so to make it easy. <clears throat> it says, do what? Looks like a hamburger. Looks like a hamburger. That's exactly what it looks like. <clears throat> and for me, it'd be cheese, pickles, and mustard. I mean, everybody knows that. So, but he stood up to read. <clears throat> and notice what corresponds with that is he sat down, right? You see that? The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and then it was given back to the attendant. And then unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, and then he rolled up the scroll. Now, we're left with the meat of the Scripture. This is the part of the Scripture that Luke is signaling out to all of us to say, this is the important part. This is the part you have to pay attention to. This is the most critical part of what you're going to study. So take a hard look at the middle. So let's take a look at the middle. In Luke, beginning in verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, before we go any further, we need to fully understand what is he really saying here when he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He identifies what kind of spirit it is. Did you notice that? It's not any spirit. It's not some spirit. It's not another spirit. It's the Spirit of God that is upon his life. 
You know, when you think about the Spirit of God, you can go back and you can look that God moved upon the face of the deep. God breathed the Spirit, the, the pneumos. In, in Hebrew, it's ruach. It means the life, the breath of God. The Spirit is moving. He breathed upon Adam and He gave him life. He breathed into your life and gave you life. He moved upon the face of the deep. He moved through the life of all of the prophets that went on before us, and He moved in the life of Moses. And what we're going to see is that His baptism the Spirit moved again and fell from heaven and came down upon him. And we see again that the Spirit of God came again in the life of the church through Pentecost. So what I'm saying to you today, it is important to get this down. It makes a difference what Spirit is in your life. You know, when I was back in the 80s when I was in seminary, the Methodist church came out with this big slogan. And it said, catch the spirit. And we were sitting in a seminary class when that came out, and our systematics professor, he said, I want to poll everybody in class today. What do you think about the slogan? We was like, man, that's great. Catch the spirit. And he said, it's got a flaw. We all sat silently, and he looked us all in the eye, and he said, they didn't tell you which spirit to catch. Do you hear me? They didn't tell you which spirit to catch. There's a lot of things out here in life. There's a lot of things that are out here that's competing against God's spirit, and those things are trying to pull us away from God. They're all pulling a different direction, but God has a path for us. That is why Luke in his gospel says clearly in this opening statement, we got to get the spirit question down first. What spirit is upon your life? Well, for this passage, we see that Luke records that the spirit of the Lord is upon Christ. The spirit has anointed him. The Spirit has blessed him. God has sent his Spirit to say, this is my son. This is the one that I'm sending. This is the one that's beginning his ministry in his hometown church. This is the one that I have sent. This is the one who is coming to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, in Luke's gospel, if you're not familiar with it, he borrows heavily a lot. There's a lot of stuff from Isaiah in Luke's gospel. And this passage that we're looking at now, when he comes in and he starts talking about he's anointed him to preach good news to the poor, he sent him to proclaim the release to the captives and to recover his sight to the blind and set at liberty all those who are oppressed, he's using the very words from Isaiah. And that's important. Because Isaiah was always proclaiming there will be this messianic figure that's going to come. And he's going to be the fulfillment. In some terms, I mean, Jeff just finished Exodus. In some terms, he could be the new Moses. He's going to bring you out, out of slavery to the new land, to the new promised land. So that's important for us to understand. And I find it really, really interesting that as he sat in the temple, in, in the synagogue, and they handed him the book, the scroll of Isaiah, and he hands it over to him. Here's Jesus. Now, we all have an advantage from this today because we can look back and say, oh, that was Jesus Christ. We know who that is. But they didn't know. But think of this irony this morning. Jesus is sitting there ready to read from the book of Isaiah. Do you know what Isaiah's name translates in Hebrew? God saves. Let that one sink in for a moment. All kinds of these things are in the scriptures. All kinds of this stuff is found that God is flashing the light right before your eyes and God is saying to you and to me and to the church, you got to get it right. You've got to get it right. God saves. 
it's pretty amazing to me that what we see in this passage is that God, through Christ, through this prophet Isaiah that he read, is proclaiming something new. It's the year of Jubilee. Now that's important because Isaiah talks about it, but also Leviticus talks about it. And I want to separate that a little bit, and we don't have to put the Leviticus up because it's a really long passage, but I want to share it with you because I want you to understand. You know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, in Leviticus would fall under the book of the law. And if you look at Leviticus, what it says about the, the Jubilee is that every 50th year, every 50th year, things revert back to the way they were. Now, let me explain that. When people came into to Israel, they got a certain allotment of land. And then over that time period, if something happened and you got in debt or you lost your land and had to go work as an indentured servant to somebody else, and those issues began to happen to you, on the 50th year, God says everything gets restored back to the way it was. Now, that was a legalistic way. Even the ground, the ground that you were harvesting from, that ground has to lay fallow for a whole year because it has to have time to regenerate. So see, that's kind of the legalistic one. But Isaiah was talking about the spiritual one. And that's the one I want to talk about today. It is so amazing that in the year of Jubilee, things will begin to change. So when Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's appointed me to what? To preach good news. To preach good news to the poor. So when we look at what Jesus' message is about, it's about proclamation. I am here to proclaim that the kingdom of God is not only at hand, but the kingdom of God is here. And all of the jubilee that you had heard from the prophets from before is now being made manifest in this moment. And it's time and in this place. Man, that's awesome when you think about it. So when he began to talk about this, he talked about the poor, and we can look at that and we can go from a materialistic perspective and say, yes, there's poor in the world. Yes, there is. And he was talking to them too because sometimes they don't have a place. They don't have a voice, and God is going to give them a voice. But I think he was also talking about something much bigger than that. You know, it's hard to say, but sometimes, even in our wealth, we can be poor. Because all these things in life that we have, that we've accumulated, may have pulled us off that path. It may have pulled us away, and we're no longer on that path that God had set out for us. Those are also poor in the Spirit. And he said that he sent me to proclaim release to the captives. You know, we don't have to think too hard on this one because there's a lot of things that will captivate your life. There's a lot of things that when you get pulled away from that path that God has us on, when we get pulled away from that, things can begin to take hold and make claims upon our life. And when they make a claim upon our life, it can pull us away and seal us off from God's abundant that he's abundance that he's going to give us in Jubilee. But the good news is we get the proclamation that God will release us, that God will pull us back. And then he said the recovery of sight to the blind, which is really important because when you think of the recovery of sight to the blind, sometimes we think of people who can't see. But I would say there's more blind people in this world than you can think that have sight because they are no longer able to see the power of what it is that God is doing in life and they have lost their spiritual sight. God has called, came through Jesus Christ so that we can see the path that we need to be on. You know, grace is really, really, truly blessed because Pastor Jeff for 
a long time, ever since I've been here, I've heard him preach of many a sermon about that path, about God's got this path and the world's got this path. And a lot of times we're on this path when we ought to be on this path. And if we're over here, we're never going to experience Jubilee. You've got to get on this path because this is the path that takes us to where we need to go. And then he's going to set liberty to all of those who are oppressed. You know, there's two theological words that I want to share with you today. One is eschatological, or the eschaton. That's the last things. That's the last things. It's the things that Isaiah was talking about in his passage, in his in his writings, he was talking about this messianic king that is coming. See, the messianic king is out here. He's on his way. He's coming to you. He's coming to me. And he's out here. But in this passage today, in verse 21, Jesus says, today this scripture has been fulfilled. Do you get it? Jesus Christ came with his, if we want to use the word corporate vision, his corporate statement was right here in this loop. And he's saying, hey, the Jubilee is here. I have showed up. God has sent me. God's spirit is upon me. And now the Jubilee is here. All that Isaiah had prophesied for before is now being fulfilled in your hearing in a little church, in, in a synagogue in Nazareth. Man, that's amazing. Can you imagine that? To be in that church when that was going down, that was awesome. That the power of God is going to rest upon Christ. The next theological word I want to give you is this. When you look at the ecclesiological aspect of this passage, that's the message for this church. It's a message for all of us, all of us, right here. Because what it's saying is, as a church, how are we dealing with the Jubilee? If somebody walked in here, didn't know us from Adam, or somebody's looking in, looking at our church, do they see the power of Almighty God, the spirit of Jubilee, breaking out among us? And just going out, they look over there and say, Wow, I don't know what's going on at Grace, but it is different. And I want to be a part of that. You see, when the Jubilee comes, then the power of God's Holy Spirit comes to rest, to bless, and to send us out in great proclamation across the land. And that is a very important thing for us to be doing because we need to be about the business of God. We need to be about the business of the Father. We need to be about helping others find their way from the path back onto the path of God. And living out that time in that place, not someday in the future, but in this moment, is what a church is called to do. That's our mission statement. That's our, that our moment. That's our time that God has given to us all. It's that moment. So what are we going to do with this wonderful jubilee that God has given to us all? You know, there's this verse down here. It's kind of troubling. It's verse 21. Because Jesus says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You might say, well, pastor, how's that troubling? I'll tell you why. Does anybody know a guarantee that you got tomorrow? No. I can tell you from my own experience, in the last three years, my heart stopped twice. So I can tell you from my own experience, all you've got is now. That's it. I can't change tomorrow. Uh, to, I can't change last year. I can't change yesterday. I can't change tomorrow, but I have today. I have this moment. This moment in time is all I've got. So I'm going to ask you today, what are you doing? What spirit is upon your life? 
How are you proclaiming the word of God? How is God working in and through your life? How is God pouring out his life upon you? And what are you doing with the opportunity that you have? That's the message of Jubilee. Because when you set yourself on fire for God, people will come to watch you burn. That's what it's like in Jubilee. Setting ourselves on fire with the Lord. That's how revival starts. That's how proclamation starts. That's how it begins to spread, not from here, but to everywhere. So I want to challenge you today. What are you doing with the grace of God that has been given to you? What are you doing with it? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just pray, Lord, that your hand of grace will come upon us, that your Holy Spirit will, will fall from heaven upon our life and upon the life of this wonderful church. That, Lord, the, the time of Jubilee as you envisioned it, Lord, let that be a time that falls upon us all and sets us on fire for your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to be a light that shines so bright that those living in darkness will want to come and be a part of that life. Lord, we just give you thanks. We give you thanks for this church, this wonderful church that you've given to us and, and the blessing that we have here and all of the talent that is here. Help us to use it for your glory and for your kingdom. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Oh,